Without further ado, would you welcome our brother from Burn 24-7, Sean Foyt. I have a word I wanted to share. If you weren't here on, um, what, what day was it they spoke? Saturday. If you weren't here for Heartbeat, we just encourage you to get that message. I was kind of, that was something I was carrying my heart, um, possibly going to share today. I decided to share it Saturday on um, remaining unoffendable. And uh, anyway, it was just a message that the Lord downloaded. But what I want to share with you guys um, on the heels of all of this crazy, renaissance, swirly, artistic, creative thing, like prophetic. I mean, what an amazing weekend. Wasn't it awesome? And uh, just to hear the prophetic words that came forth, one of the uh, <clears throat> reasons, you know, Sean, he's a great friend of mine. We've been, we've been doing our Sean and Sean thing <laughs> around the world a little bit. He, of course, I spell my name the right way, you know, and make sure that he knows that. His is short for Shauna. Uh, but anyway, you can tell him I said that. But, uh, but I, had, I had a heart, like, this year, for, I asked him, you know, at the beginning of the year, he's crazy demanded upon right now to travel, and, and, and we've, we've gone to some pretty cool places together. But I said, man, there's a couple communities. We just really want your impartation because you operate in a high-level prophetic gift, but you're not super weird. Anybody appreciate that? Like, and I, you know, it's, it's okay to be weird. Like, I, that's part of the deal, and we're peculiar people, and I get all that. But I do believe that there is an impartation of the prophetic that can speak to normal people in the normal world. And I believe that God, I believe there's even a demystification of the prophetic and that there is an invitation for us to be just normal prophets that do life and work and have kids, but yet we carry a prophetic spirit. So I really, uh, that's not what I'm going to share, but I, I, I do want to open up with Second Peter 1, and I just want to hammer you guys once again, coming on the heels of what um, Dave was speaking about identity last week, which I heard was amazing. No one teaches an identity like him. It's so amazing. Um, I want to share a little bit and remind you of the prophetic promises over your life, over this community. I, my heart is really just to be a, a friend of this community that continually reminds yourself. I want to come and put a massive mirror up, you know, and say, hey, remember who you are. Look at yourself again, you know. And I think I mentioned last week about that part in Lion King where Simba looked down in the water, you know, and he realized that he was actually a full-grown male lion, you know. Do you guys remember that part, Lion King? We've got kids. We, we're, we're all about it. So, I, I feel like today is one of those reminders again. But Second Peter 1, um, verse 19, it says this. We, ha we also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable. Say reliable. You can take your money to the bank. The prophetic word is reliable. It will happen. And why will it happen? Because the word became flesh. John 1. Why is that so epic? If the word became flesh, every word that we receive will become flesh. I mean, this is what was so powerful even about Jesus. He wasn't just a great idea that Old Testament prophets talked about. He manifested himself. He showed up to the game. And he did everything he said he was going to do. And so it says we have this word, the prophetic message, as something completely reliable. And you will do well to pay attention to it. I mean, this, for, this is powerful. Like, it's not just a frivolous, you know, and I love hanging out with Jerry. Jerry, I just love Jerry so much. He has given me and my wife some of the most epic words. My wife found, um, uh, found a card that he wrote in for our wedding the other day and, and it's wrote this crazy prophetic word. It was kind of hard to read, but we read it. And it spoke about nations and all these places we're going to go and these things we're going to do around the world. And it was funny because at the time we got married, my wife came out of a really traumatic YWAM experience. And she was like, yeah, I know you want to go over the world. I don't want to go anywhere. I'm scared to be on planes. I just got stung by the most poisonous jellyfish in the Pacific. And I was, uh, you know, paralyzed for two days. We're not going to the nations, just by the way. And then we got this prophetic word and and. We held on to it, and, you know, even when I showed up here um, at the airport the other day and Jerry was driving us because we got in late, he was reminding us again and again on the drive the whole way, 
this is ground zero for the move of God. Don't forget, you know. And, and, and those prophetic words, like, th- this is the word. It, it, it is completely reliable, and you would do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the dawn and the morning star rises in your heart. And I believe this whole weekend was one prophetic swirl that was reminding us. I believe it was a, I actually feel it was a really big deal. I I believe heartbeat and what we experienced this weekend, I believe it was a massive deal for this community. I believe that, um, you know, even as we were, as we were coming into this, we just moved to California. It was crazy time. Sean's in a crazy season. And uh, I was like, it was so hard to leave home and there's so much going on, but yet, it was like the moment I got on the plane, and the same for Sean because we flew out here together. We just were just overcome by what if this is a defining moment. I mean, we have to think like that these days. Where we break out of the monotony of conferences and events and another service and another deal. And what we have to be like Acts chapter 2, you know, where Peter goes, Hey guys, this is that. I mean, which is so crazy. And I, I actually, uh, I want to read just Joel 2.28 real quick because we, we went there for a minute um, when we were, uh, when I was talking about, you know, Adam back in the day, you know, we were standing up there and he was leading Joel 2.28 and they were so cool. They had Abercrombie clothes and drank coffee and, you know, but we, and we just idolized, you know, their leadership and everything they did. But this this word, like this acts, acts to reality, it's, it's crazy when you look back on it, that Peter would have the boldness and the courage to stand up after, like, tongues of fire came down, people are singing in different languages, never seen anything like this in history, and he goes, hey guys, by the way, this is the very word that was promised in Joel, even though the book of Joel the, looks nothing like what we're seeing now. He was correlating two events that seemed polar opposite. Joel's talking about, you know, your young men will see dreams, your old men will see visions, and then Acts chapter 2 is tongues of fire and different languages. But somehow there was a prophetic spirit that struck a chord in him, and he said, no, I know this is the beginning of the fulfillment of the promise. This is that. And I just felt like this weekend with this merging of the prophetic spirit and the arts and this renaissance thing, I just want to declare, what if this is that? A couple people are with me. <laughs> like, what if we are really moving into a renaissance movement? What if all of Ghent is about to be totally transformed with prophetic art and prophetic words and a prophetic culture that's going to bring a dynamic shift? What if it's not five and six and seven and eight and nine, ten years? What if it's not when you guys get your own building? What if it's not, you know, what, what if today is actually the day? What if it's the beginning of a new season? What if there are people that are crazy enough to believe that? You know, and I, I, I do believe it. I, 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 when I woke up this morning, I was just struck in my spirit like I, I feel like. And turn to uh, Joshua 14. This is what I want to get to. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. There's something about, you know, this is why you need idealistic young people that keep coming up with the most outrageous visions over and over and over again. They just know no limitations. And you don't go to those idealistic young people and go, oh, well, that's really sweet. You don't know what it's going to take to get there. No, you go to those people and you go, share that vision again and again and again because it's so outrageous. To think that the homosexual community could be saved in a moment. You know, like that kind of stuff. And then the old men and the old women, like not cynics, not skeptics, not, not, you know, that that are free from offense and free from disillusionment and are still dreaming like never before. Sons and daughters, mothers and fathers. And I love this story right here because it's about an old man. Say old man. Like soup's old. Like totes old, you know? And um, at the beginning of Joshua 13, it says that when Joshua had grown old, I love that it starts with that. And, you know, old in the Bible times was like 180 or something, you know? When Joshua had grown old, the Lord said to him, You are now very old. <laughs> <laughs> this is so funny. It's like, oh, thanks, God. That's appreciate it. 
Thanks for pointing the obvious. You are now very old, and yet there are still very large areas of land to be taken over. Come on. I mean, this, this story has just rocked me, you know. Hey, by the way, you're old, but you're not done. <laughs> We've been doing the turn to somebody, so just turn to somebody. Say, you're old, but you're not done. <laughs> so God said, oh, we, we like that. You are now very old, and yet there are still large areas. So, I mean, God, thank you that, you know, God speaks real time. Like, he tells us what we need to hear. And, 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 and Joshua, good thing he doesn't sink into discouragement. Oh, 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 play the victim and all this kind of stuff, you know. It's like, I, I believe God's freeing us from a victim mentality in America. Christians are not victims. You're victors. And, man, this is a message. It goes back to identity. It goes back to getting in the presence. It goes back to everything you guys are on track for. But we're getting free from that. So it says you're very old, and there's still large areas that are still be taken over. Skip down to uh, Joshua 14, verse 8. And so in this season of him being really old, the Lord starts reminding them again of the prophetic word they got when they were young. And I was thinking about this. I was thinking of Adam especially, you know, I was, I asked him this morning, like, did they ever, rec like, sometimes I just want to go back and hear some of those old school, like, Joel 228 worship songs. We almost played one this morning, you know. But just the old school songs and the prophetic moments and, 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 because that, that literally is like a road map to what has gotten everyone here. And, and, and I feel like even this morning is a, is a, Redigging or an unearthing of those again. And so, anyway, verse, uh, verse four, uh, chapter 14, verse 4. I just want to hit on this part because it's really funny. It says, the Levites received no share of the land. Classic. But only towns to live in. And, uh, you know, the Bible says this again and again and again. Numbers 18 is another, is another passage where it's like, hey, you guys get this land, and you guys get this land, and you guys get this land. But Levites, eh musicians, now nah, you get gypped, you know. And uh, I used to get so offended of reading that over and over in the Old Testament, but then in Numbers, the next verse after that says, you have no inheritance because you need no inheritance because I'm your inheritance. Which is always the promise to the worshiping community, right? I mean, CDs are great, record deals are great, songs are great, worship services are great, but at the end of the day, our greatest reward is the presence is Him. Like, this is what we're all in it for, amen? It's him. And so then it says in verse, verse 6, Now the people of Judah approached Joshua, Gilgal, and Caleb, son of Jephthah. The Kezanite said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God at Kadesh, about you and me. This is a buddy reminding a buddy. I'm a buddy reminding a buddy. Hey, you remember what was said about you. At Kadesh with Moses, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me to Kadesh Barnaria to explore the land. And I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my fellow Israelites who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt in fear. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. It's amazing to me that we literally, it's like we have a choice, especially these days. What dominates your perspective determines your reality. And you know, Adam was singing about it. I don't know, if, I've never heard a worship song about Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump or Vladimir Putin. That was incredible. <laughs> it was, I was, only a big house can, can something like that fly I was thinking about taking that song to Bethel or something, you know, and live stream that thing. But, <laughs> but literally, like, like we have the ability. Like, it's like it's crazy. He goes up there with the same with the same people, and yet they bring back a totally different report. 
a completely different report. Like, they're both seeing the same thing, but yet he's a man of conviction, which I think is very important in this day. And yet he was with the Israelites who decided to relegate and melt into fear. Fear will paralyze your pursuit and freeze your dreams. I want to read this. this uh, where's my jam? Yeah, that's a tweet. Somebody tweet that. I want to read this just quick, quick deal from um, Run With the Horses by Eugene Peterson. Great book. And uh, he says in here, if we forget that the newspapers are footnotes to Scripture and not the other way around, we will finally be afraid to get out of bed in the morning. Too many of us spend far too much time with the editorial section and not nearly enough time with the prophetic vision. Boom. Hashtag. We underestimate God and we overestimate evil. We don't see what God is doing and conclude that he is doing nothing. For if we are going to, to, to live in God's image, alive to all that is God, open and responsive to all that, is, that he is doing, we must trust in his word, trust what we do not see. It's interesting, I just came back from uh, Jakarta, Indonesia uh, two weeks ago and it's crazy. Uh, I, I think I mentioned this maybe the last time I was here. Uh, there, there's such a, a massive revival that's hitting that nation right now. 250 million Muslims that, 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 that's so strong and so intense that one Muslim every seven seconds is coming to Jesus. It's outrageous. And, um, and I was with this. Uh, I just so happened to be, it's just a crazy God thing, but I, I met the... I think the third most wealthy couple in Southeast Asia. They're, they're multi-billionaires. They own the most extravagant mall there, and they own this five-star hotel. But yet their heart, they got, since they got saved, uh, their heart burns for the presence. And so we were literally there, and the purpose of the trip was we were dedicating a prayer room and raising up uh, worship and, and prayer furnace planters that were going to go across the nation. About 300 of them met. And, you know, I thought going to Indonesia, I thought it would, you know, be like a decent building somewhere on some street. Well, we met in the swankiest mall in the country, and they literally turned the store in between Gucci and Versace into a prayer house. I'm dead serious. And because they own the mall, they can do whatever they want, you know. And, and they, they turned this, and it was extravagant, ornate. I mean, it was like high end, and, and then... Um, she, I, I don't know, they, they loved it so much, they took me on a shopping spree through the mall, which is pretty epic. <laughs> and she had a card, you know. She had a card. She's just like, no problem, swipe, no problem, swipe, you know. Uh, never had that happen before. <laughs> I will be going back, no. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, what was amazing, she was telling me, you know, that since they've been really, really pressing into Jesus, the, all these really wealthy people there have been getting so much threats and attacks, you know, on on the government and all the, you know, suppressing them because it's a very, it's a heavy is Islamic regime. Well, in the last year, these wealthy guys stood their ground and they actually helped put in, for the first time ever, a Chinese Christian governor who's ruling Jakarta right now. A city of 26 million people never before in history has been led by a Christian minority, Chinese minority, and that one year into it, the guy has kicked corruption out of the city. It's like, it's unreal. But there was a process where they had to stand up and stand their ground and be people of conviction and not give in and press in. And they were just telling me these stories of, of death threats and uh, churches being burned and all of this stuff. And, she's, and she just looked at me, this little Asian lady. She said, but we did not let down, you know. <laughs> And, and I just, I really believe, anyway, going back to the story, this is a big part of Caleb's journey. It says that, but my fe fellow Israelites went up with me, made the hearts of the people melt in fear. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So on that day, Mo Moses swore to me, and he's reminding Joshua again, who's really old, and God says it's really old. The land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever because you have followed the Lord my, my God wholeheartedly. It's almost like he's saying, hey, listen, dude, it's about your children's children's children. It's about your children's children's children. Come out of yourself. It's not even about your tiny little life. 
It's about the fact of your children and your inheritance, and this is your calling. I just almost broke down the other day. Jeremy Perigo, which you guys know and love, sent me this email from 2008 from my dad before he passed away about his heart that burned for the Kurdish people. And this is before ISIS. This was, I think, you know, maybe right before the, the war over there. And he wrote this email, and it was just like, I had never read it before, and I, Jeremy forgot that he had it, and he was just reminded, and the whole email is saying, Jeremy, we have to find a way to reach them. We'll raise more money. Can you and Angie, can you be sent over there? We have to reach these people. This is the time. This is the season, you know? And, and, and I remember even, even standing there at Duke, Duke, uh, Duke Hospital, you know, looking at the number one brain surgeon in the world that operated on Teddy Kennedy and all these other guys that was giving us the grim news of, my father's brain tumor, and the first question out of my dad's mouth is, hey, um, yeah, I know you, you said we only have three months to live, da, 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 but I really need to go with my son to Iraq next month. That was his first question. And you should have seen this brain surgeon's mouth just dropped open, and he goes, are you kidding me? Are you really asking me this? And I, I, I feel now more than ever, you know, of course, I do believe I'm walking in, in, in inheritance with my father. And we're seeing things that he, he only dreamed of seeing. But I feel like all of us collectively as a people, we're building something for generations. It's not about a conference. It's not about an event. It's not about a fad. It's not about a season. It's, we are building that our children's children's children go higher and deeper and farther than we could ever imagine. And this is why, for 2 Peter 1, we have to hold on to the prophetic promises. Because they're not just about us. Name it, claim it. Rolls Royce, Mercedes, give me the house, give me the It's not even about that. It's about the future <laughs> generations of our family. And so it says, those name it, claim it guys are funny. It says, now then, just as the Lord had promised, verse 10, he has kept me alive 45 years since the time he said this to Moses. So 45 years later, he has not forgotten. Just a stubborn, old, growly kind of guy. You know, it's going to happen. I know it's going to happen. Remembering, remember. And I wonder, you know, how many times, we don't know, we don't have a record of, but I wonder how many times Caleb reminded people again and again and again. Again and again and again. He just kept talking about it. He just kept reminding people. At least. It says, I am still, and this is my favorite verse right here, guys. It says, while Israel moved in about in the wilderness. So here I am today, 85 years old. I love this verse right here. This is just so dope. I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I am just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. <laughs> 85 years old. Let me at him. <laughs> I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up hope. Now then, give me this hill country that the Lord promised me. Other versions, give me my mountain. This is like Braveheart epic moment, wearing a kilt, painting your face with the sword, you know. Give me my mountain. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified, but the Lord is helping me. I will drive them out just as he has said. Then Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Jephthah, and gave him Hebron as inheritance. And the story ends as it always ends. Then the land had rest from war. Keeping the energy, keeping the pursuit. Do not grow weary in well-doing. Man, as I heard the songs up there last night, and I saw the indie films, didn't understand all of them, but they were epic. And I saw the art and experience what God is bringing to reality through this church and through this body. I just cannot help thinking about how the world so desperately needs this message and that we just have to get it right. We have to hold on to it. In the mountains that are represented in this room, 
You know, I believe this is a new school prophetic movement, not one where we just gather around the pulpit to hear some great new word, but we are literally imparted with the Spirit to go out and actually do it. And I believe you guys are going to do it, and ma many of you are doing it, but I, I, I firmly believe that there's this holding on to the promise, and there's this reminding of each other, and then there's this stepping in to claim the mountain of destiny and inheritance that God has for each one of us. In the craziest day in the world, while people are drowning in disillusionment and discouragement and offense, I was joking the other day, it's like everyone's offended at somebody because somebody offended them. And it's like the spirit of offense is ravaging a generation because they're forgetting the prophetic promise. They're forgetting the lifeline. They're forgetting the word. They're forgetting the destiny. And at my heart today, and I'm going to close here in a minute, is maybe that we would just look in each other's eyes before we leave. 85, 45, 15, really old, really young, and we would just say, give me my mountain. That this would be a community that stirs people up to remind us again, give me that mountain. <laughs> this is one of the things I love about Adam, like put, you know, he said we can go all night and then put his guitar down and said let's go three more minutes and just dance like a drunk, whatever thing that was. But I love that. I love that like you guys are, are creating an atmosphere where wildness can be released. I told you this a couple weeks ago. You can't lose that. You know, and I feel like a big part of that is us keeping each other accountable to the dreams and the mountains that God has for each one of us. Refusing the paranoia, refusing the, the, the press. I was, I was thinking, you know, just the other day about how, you know, the highest art that's released is the prophetic art that reminds us who we are. Like good worship songs are the songs that pull us into the promises of God again. And we sing them over and over again. And, you know, a lot of times we don't, we sing them and we sing them and, and we sing them and sometimes it takes us 20 minutes of singing them until we actually mean what we're singing. Because our lives are so crazy and we, we come, sometimes come in so robotic and it's so predictable. And, but yet worship and music and creativity pulls us into a space we begin to dream again. We begin to dream with each other. We begin to dream with God. When, you know, Nick gets up there and plays, I call it the portal pad, you know. When he plays the glory portal pad on his keys, you know, and, and woos us all into this space where we just feel light again. You know what I'm talking about? Where you feel like you can do anything again. Where you feel, you know, it's like my favorite thing about little kids they can do anything. And they know that. From the, from the littlest age and the older they grow, the more that we temper that. So we want to keep them safe. But there is old men dreaming dreams and young men seeing visions. And this is the season where it's manifesting. This is that in Big House. This is that in Virginia. I mean, how many crazy more people need to come through here? I mean, it's like, Mike Bickle, are you kidding me? He only goes to see the Pope. He has never even been, he doesn't even know anything about this. He's just like, you know, it's like he came because he felt compelled to remind us about first love and the beauty of Jesus. And Stacy Campbell was just up here shaking. She's, she prophesied over the Pope before he was the Pope. I mean, you guys have had some amazing treasures come in, and I feel like you've been so equipped with prophetic words that this is a season where you're going to manifest them. Amen. So let's, let's do something. Let's, let's, hold our let's stand up and hold our brave heart swords up. <clears throat> yeah, that's Yeah, and we're just, g get on the portal pad. We're, <laughs> we, <laughs> we are literally going to scream, give me my mountain. Like a gnarly 85-year-old dude clenching his fists. You know what I'm saying? Like, 
not willing. It's like that story, you know, where they're fighting and his fist gripped the sword and it wouldn't let go. It froze to the sword, you know. So we're going to say, give me my mountain on the count of three. But, you know, I've said this before, especially you girls, like, the most dangerous lions are the female lions. Uh, I'm serious. I'm I hunt in Africa quite a bit, and that's always the thing. They're like, if you see a male lion, you're cool. You see a, a couple of females, <laughs> you're in trouble. So, so don't, you know, don't be afraid to get crazy, all right? There's portal. All right. On the count of three, give me my mountain. One, two, three. Okay. <laughs> now, one more time, look to someone next to you. And, and, like, this needs to be scary. Like, scare them, okay? Scare them, okay? On the count of three. One, two, three. We thank you for prophetic vision being restored. We thank you, God, for courage, God, being instilled in our hearts today. We thank you, God, that we are in the middle of an amazing swirl of destiny that's going to affect our children's children's children. And so we just pray right now, God, that we would leave here with tenacious resolve. Tenacious resolve steadfast. I was singing over you earlier. He steadies us. He steadies us. He steadies us into his promises. He steadies us. Lord, steady our hearts tonight. Give us our mountain. Every unfulfilled dream. I feel like some of you in here, you, you got dreams flowing in your lineage you have no idea about. It's like, until I got that email, I was like, why are we just, why am I so crazy about the Kurdish peoples? What is going on? Like, I just, ah, I just can't get out of me. And I'm like, oh, because it's in my destiny. Because it was in my dad's heart. And I'm carrying that, you know. And I feel like for some of you, there's dreams and there's visions that have yet to come forth inside of you. There's prophetic words and promises. And I feel like this is the season. This is the season where we get to do it. Not just see somebody do it, but we get to do it. We thank you, Father. We receive this tonight. Come on, just thank him for those words and promises. Let's just lift up those words and promises you've got.